want to kind of check in on a half a dozen different things. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about budget, but I'll save that to the end. That tends to be a more boring sort of conversation. I think the biggest thing that's on folks' minds now is, you know, what, what the heck are we going to do with these days that we missed because of um, the heat failure that we had? And so <clears throat> a part of the discussion for tonight is I'm going to go through and give you kind of the basics, what the regs are and what the law is um, that we have to follow as we consider this. Um, and try to generate some ideas from the community. One of the things that's really important is we will have to make up some days uh, more at the high school than at the tech center. And it's figuring out the best way to do that. Because if I don't get 50% of the students to show up on any day that we run as a makeup day, it doesn't count. And I only have the teachers for so many days uh, out of a year. If we run a day, the teachers are here, they use up the day, students don't hit 50%. But <coughs> we can get so far out of whack that we can't make up the days that we need. And so that's something that we want to avoid. Now, they make everything really, really easy. So the calendar basics here. <clears throat> teachers are contracted for 185 days a year. Under our contract, um, there are six days that are required for professional development when the school students are not here. <coughs> we have contingency and snow days um, that do not need to be made up as part of the teacher's contract. So the first two days of uh, snow days every year do not get made up. <coughs> We've already had our two days, so that puts us down here. Maximum number of, of student days um, in a typical year is 177. Subtract all this stuff up, and right now <clears throat> we've got to make sure that we get the minimum of 175 days that are required by the state. And then the other thing that makes things a little quirky is the teachers are under year-long contracts. They end in June 30th, <coughs> so we cannot go past June 30th as a date. So does this make a little bit of sense? So that's the golden number right now. In terms of what qualifies for a student day. 50% of the students have to be present. <coughs> the day has to last at least five and a half instructional hours. Or you have to have 27.5 hours in a week, and then you can count it as five days. <coughs> we talked a little bit about this um, at the very beginning, right? The remaining number of teacher days must equal or exceed the required number of student days. If we get things that are out of whack, I run out of teacher days um, before I can meet that 175 day requirement and then we've got problems. Where we currently stand, <coughs> RTCC wasn't as bad. They had, uh, they had fewer days out. They were a smaller building so the temporary heating units that we brought in were able to heat it well enough so we were able to get them back in pretty quick. RUHS, on the other hand, was so spread out, those heating units just couldn't do the job. They were good enough to keep the pipes from freezing, and that was about it. <clears throat> so, in terms of the tech center, if we add up all the days so far that had been missed, they missed a day due to the water leak, they had two snow days, they had four days that were lost due to the heating failure. If we add in two really simple days that we normally would have had off this year, which is MLK Day and the town meeting day, they're at 172 days, so we got to make up three. Not so bad. We might even be able to get the state to be able to waive those so we don't have to worry about them. But that's a discussion that we want to have in here. In terms of the high school, <clears throat> right, they lost the same two snow days. They lost 11 days due to the heat failure. And then we can make up two because of MLK in the town meeting. That means it would get us to 166 student days. So there's nine days that we have to make up to meet the state. And again, <coughs> we're just at the beginning of the winter season, so this assumes no more snow days. Any snow days that, that hit us between now and springtime, we're going to have to make up as well. So questions on the basic kind of thoughts and ideas that kind of go into these considerations. Lane, what does instructional time actually mean at the high school level? So does not you include lunch or recess. Uh, so you said uh, 27.5 hours of instructional, <coughs> I think it was a slide before that. 
of instructional time in a week count as five days? Yeah, so this is the reason we can have half days that we have um, for professional development purposes. Our half days aren't 5.5 hours. The kids are out after about three and a half to four. Right. But because our other days are longer by the end of the week, we've still met the 27.5 hour requirement. So we still get credit for the full week. Okay. If that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. Would longer days be an option to help catch up since the busing's there, the kids were already there? Does that help at all, or is that just wasting time? <coughs> so these are the possibilities, and you've hit on one of them. There are um, pros and cons to each. We can seek to have the days waived, right? I can't do that until February. The state board that makes the decision will not meet on any kind of request for waivers until mid-February. So we've got some things that we've got to decide prior to then. And I'm not opposed to waiving days. For the high school, however, since one of our goals is educating kids, I would not like to waive all of them. Right? You know, if we could make up if we could make up a quarter and a half of them, I think I would be happy. But that's a discussion that we want to talk about here tonight is one of the parents and the students kind of comfortable with. Um, so the possibilities that came up, and some of them were kind of interesting. Um, right, we've got the idea that we could waive days. 5.5 hour days on Saturdays. And this was actually interesting. Um, the students, when we had a little student group, were the ones that brought the, this up. And this is the one that they were the most favorable towards. And we said, well, what, what, is, what is that all about? And they said, well, you know what? If we start doing them now, it's wintertime. We don't have a lot of activities that are going on you know, in our lives outside of school in the middle of winter. So this would be an ideal time to just kill them off and get them out of the way. So it was kind of an interesting observation that they made. We could add additional hours to each day, as David was talking about. This we would have to, again, wait till February and have the state board. I, I checked on the regs, have the state board allow us to do that. The problem is, is that when you've got a lot of days to make up, let's say we add an hour, hour and a half on to each day, right? It's going to take five days to make up one day. So it, it's not a bad option, but it's going to take a long time to get us where we need to go, if that's the only thing that we do. The other possibility is reducing the length of the February and or April vacations um, or adding days to the end of the school year. There are actually enough days in the calendar um, if we don't get more than two more snow days um, mm -hmm. to be able to complete all this by June 30th if we add it to the end of the school year. And then the other idea is that we can do a combination of them. And so the discussion I think here tonight that's going to be helpful to me is first off, do people have ideas above and beyond these um, that have come up? And then secondly, what are the pros and cons? What are the things that people here think that they could most support? Because again, once we make a decision in terms of what we're going to do, I've got to have at least 50% of the student body showing up on those days. So if I'm not getting, um, if I don't have the support from the community and the kids aren't showing up, we're not going to meet what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, sort of a technical question. Um, if we've already got graduation scheduled, right, mm -hmm. and then we graduate our seniors, um, do they count as mm -hmm. part of the student body that has to be that 50%? So that, that would that's yeah, make life a little bit more difficult. Um, and technically, they would need to come back. Um, if they have things that are going on, some of them do. Um, those are things that we would have to talk about. A lot of states, you know, Massachusetts, when I was there, um, usually the first Sunday in June, that was their graduation day, and the seniors were away from any other day. And I could actually make that request on behalf of uh, just the seniors, um, which is actually a good idea. I'll put that down. My intent, at least on the waiver, um, is to ask for all the days from the state board, because then if they grant them, it gives us the most flexibility in terms of what we decide. So I'll stop talking for a little while and see what ideas folks have. And I'll, I'll take some good notes as, as folks are, are, are thinking their way through things. <clears throat> you don't need to raise your hands. Okay, uh, Lane, so is online off the table? 
So that was the most frustrating piece of all of this. Um, <clears throat> being able to have remote sessions count as days towards student mm -hmm. learning was a legislative action that took right. place um, right. for COVID. Yeah. It ended when the state of emergency ended. Right. And so that was the first question I asked the Secretary of Education, and no, we can't do it anymore. Well, so, so here's my question about this then. Given the fact that you already have to go to the board, I forget what board you have to go to, in February to get days waived, yeah. and to reduce the length of whatever, and the session starts in January, the legislative session. Um, it would seem to me that there is potential, potential, to make a case to put online remote into this mix for a certain amount of things. So um, I don't know what that looks like, but if you can, like, you know, maybe the uh, Board of Education, Dan French, can do something. You can get Mary, I don't want to tell Larry what he needs to do, but Larry Sackwitz can jump in. And maybe you can get a waiver for nine days, right? You know, or something that's very clear in a box that would maybe help it. Yeah. We, um, one of the things that we did um, have a discussion about when this came up, because we were so frustrated about the inability to use the remote days, was I talked with the superintendent's association and the board that oversees them, um, and they will be making a request to the legislature, basically to say, look, the teachers learn all these skills mm -hmm. in terms of remote sessions. It seems like we should have some law that's on the books so that if people hit an emergency like this one, right. Right, we can use this. Right, and, and, and it could, there could be a process by which you, you go to the you know, yeah. Department of Education to ask for the waiver, but they are able to give it. Their hands aren't tied. Yeah, and that's, that's on the, um, that is on the, the plate. You know, mm -hmm. whether the legislature listens this is another story. They're usually pretty good about listening, but mm -hmm. sometimes getting stuff done is a little harder. Right. But it makes logical sense from given a circumstance like we had. So what you got, Dave? My initial thought was going later in June or filling some vacation days might be the most quality days. Like if we try to do longer days or Saturdays, kids burn out, teachers burn out. I feel like you're getting outside people's normal rhythms. It may not be as quality. But um, then I heard, you know, is it Mr. Moynihan? Yes. That was a good point. Like if you're going to lose all your seniors, that may not be an advisable strategy. Uh, has there been any feedback from teachers on their thoughts or preferences? This is uh, the first time okay. we've got a few teachers here, and there will be another kind of group um, to get some more ideas. Okay. Um, I was trying to get the community together uh, as quickly as possible, and I know this isn't an ideal time with the holidays coming, um, but just to get the conversation rolling. Because the end process of this is we'll put out a survey and just see where the, the preferences are. Because again, we've got to have that 50%. When is the last day of school this year? Uh, June 16th right now. Um, I can actually throw that calendar up here. <coughs> Probably graduation schedule for that, mm -hmm. that week here. Yeah. So June, yeah, June 16th is, is the last day right now. Um, and again, it will extend if we get more, more snow days. We already did kind of <coughs> had to change a couple of things in the calendar. Like I said, Martin Luther King Day, the 16th here in January, we're just going to have school that day. You know, I, I hate to do it, but it's an easy pickup, so that's an easy call. Um, the town meeting day that happens in March on the 7th, you know, that's an easy pickup. There's no legal requirement to do that. In fact, most schools that close on town meeting day, they do it because people vote in the schools, the voting machines are in the schools which is not, not the case for us. I think Brookfield does once in a while. Where, where have they been they doing do. it? They, they vote at the school, but it wouldn't affect the elementary school kids, right? No, no it, sh it shouldn't. And we can also make the request to, for them to use the town hall this year to help us out. So that, that's possible. But no matter what decision we make, it wouldn't affect the elementary kids. Nope. Right. <clears throat> it, um, only thing you worry a little bit about, especially in today's day and age, you know, if the voters are coming in, well, you've got the, the kids there. You want to keep them a little bit separate just because of security reasons. But the, but the elementary kids could take that day off because they didn't have to take time off. Right, they could. Earlier. That's a good right. point. So, so whatever happens here is strictly for the high school. It doesn't imp it, 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 and the middle school, the kids who were physically yeah. in this building, but the elementary schools could still take those days off. You are correct. 
<laughs> would that be problematic for parents, though, who have kids of both ages? Who have kids who watch kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. That I don't know. But it's a, it's a really good observation, so I'll get that to vote down on that. I'm wondering if there would be, like, if there was a possibility of, you know, taking, or like, doing Saturdays or, you know, extending the school day, would there be room to, like, restructure the day so, like, students and teachers wouldn't get, like, as burnt out from having to just do so much all at once? I mean, I think we can restructure the day. Um, I'm, I'm pointing at you because you had some good ideas on that when we were talking about it with the students. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that came up was potentially having, like, a an extra block that would rotate through each day so you get like an extra class of each class. Period one um, on Monday, period two on Tuesday. Period. Yep. Um, so that it wouldn't just be, you know, like a study hall after school, which I think could be hard for everybody. Um, what were some of the other things that they were coming up with? I mean, I have notes, you know, the but. students who we met with, um, they were thinking about like experiential learning opportunities if it was a Saturday or something like that, you know, to really kind of mix things up um, and use it almost as like the way in which some schools have a J term or something like that. It would be like our Saturday term, you know, and we would, you know, infuse passion projects for teachers and students to work on together. So those were some of the things that we heard from the students when they proposed the Saturday. Um, option. One teacher that I have talked to um, suggested like adding an hour but instead of it just being like an hour to kill at the end of the day um, their suggestion was like if each core teacher added 10 or 15 minutes to the end of their class so they have a little bit extra time that way it doesn't fall all on somebody new to pick up that extra hour but they could actually and it's not just dead time where they're you know, filling the requirements, but they actually could use it for learning, and then no single teacher has to take the whole burden of mm -hmm. filling the time. That if they added 10 to 15 minutes to some core classes, that that could be beneficial. So it's so Tim. So you, the question it would then be if we added 15 minutes to a block, would that be too much? Well. Mm -hmm. um, so you're teaching a course where yeah. hands-on is, so you might not be the best Before I answer that question, I just want to say, <laughs> I'm just one guy. I, I represent yeah. no one but me. Um, but, um, I mean, so you're asking me, could I foresee doing that plan? Manage it. Yes, I, I could, but I can't speak for anyone else. Yeah, the, the pe people I would worry the most about are, are straight math. Um, this was from a math teacher that oh, suggested yeah. that. Yeah. It wasn't me. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you, usually the, the you know we, we've been talking about you know changing master schedules and things. Usually the, the, the worst master schedules out there are ninety minute blocks, except for science teachers and art teachers. They do <coughs> blocks, but um, so but yeah, no, it's a, it's a good idea. So I've got that down. The idea of having instead of adding just an hour at the end of the day that one teacher you know encompasses, you know maybe adding fifteen mm -hmm. minutes to the core classes, mm -hmm. so that they get the extra time in that way. So it's not a bad idea at all. So I'm wondering about parent conference day. Yeah. So yes, it's important that parents speak to teachers, but given the extenuating circumstances, can you buy a day by not doing that? So we've already. So here was the thing with the parent conference days. This works, right? Yeah, it does because we have two of them. We have been counting them as student days because the students come in and do portfolios, but they don't. We don't quite get fifty percent of the students in on those days. Uh, they also prepare and do the presentations. Um, so recognizing that um, as we go forward, those conference days can't count as student days unless they're half days. And so what we've done. Um, that's the other reason. That's the reason the conference day, the purple one here in March, has been highlighted, is because that's got to be a half day. But it can't be a full day? Uh, it can't be a full conference day. 
Um, they do not, I, I, teachers do not want to give up the conferences. Um, that was one of the discussions we've, we've had in previous years. Right. Um, <clears throat> connecting with the, with the parents and having the students actually do those presentations is very beneficial. So I'll just, uh, you know, I'd hate to be the person who says, yeah. what about our <clears throat> online opportunities? I mean, we've all, we've been through this. Yeah. Um, there have been parent, teacher, and st you know, student conferences via Zoom. Given the extenuating circumstances, if it, if it buys you a day, yeah. then why not <clears throat> schedule conferences in the evenings for, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a couple of weeks? It's not ideal, but you still get to parents and you still get to have the conversations, but you still get a day in class. But the, the, and your, your logic is exceptional. Um, the, the reason that this won't help us is because the 20, this 22nd already counted it's as already a student counted day. Today. Okay. So as we move forward, we're having to either, we either have to get rid of them because the state doesn't count them towards student days or we have to do them as half days. Half days. And so that's already going to be a half day. Yeah, um, going forward. And so that's to also to make sure that we're not getting those counts out of whack in terms of teacher days and student days making sure that we're meeting the requirements here. And this one is quirky anyway. We have to get rid of the 21st. Um, that was a half day. So it would have counted as a full day under normal circumstances. But if you had two half days in the same week, we, you get over that 27.5 hours. So we have to get rid of one. So this PD day is going away. That'll be a full day that 21st. Okay. So that's how you're buying a little bit of half day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so good, good conversation. Other, other thoughts, other ideas? Other preferences. Um, go ahead. So, Lane, I would advocate for not doing extended days or Saturdays for strictly the fact of the kids that do extracurricular activities. Okay. Um, with the basketball sports team right now, the gym is occupied from 2.30 till almost 9.30 at night. Pushing that back an hour I don't think is really a good idea. And then, of course, there's activities on Saturdays that students would be participating in as far as games and so the, the Saturday one makes makes sense here's a here's a, a thought and, and, and see what you think because um, we kind of had this discussion on the extended days we could push our own practices back and then kids that had um, competitions that still need to get there at the normal time they just leave early that's what happens in most schools especially when they have to travel Right, so, so you're, you're saying to have the practices from 3.30 to 10 instead, Possibly. instead of 2.30 to 9. That just seems yep. like a long, long day. Yeah. Um, I, Mar Marblehead, um, our field house, the kids would get started. It would run until, until 11, 11.30 um, to get all the practices in that they needed to in the wintertime. So, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's a possibility. Um, but Well, I have your attention. Do you have... Uh, or did you have days in mind when you're talking about the February, April vacation, or is that just kind of an open... No, it's, it was one of the ideas that, that folks had kind of thrown out as a possibility. Um, we didn't even want to discuss, you know, the vacation we're approaching because people probably already have pretty solid plans, which makes right. a lot of sense. Potentially February, they probably, some folks probably have plans, but hopefully it doesn't, you know, wouldn't get us to violate the 50%. Well, April is far enough out that... It's probably a little more restrictive. Because I'm thinking you're going to hit your 50% mark a lot easier in February and April than you are at the end of June. Yeah. So are you saying you think there's a, a preference to use some of those days? I wouldn't want to use all of them. You don't, you, you'd rather do like a three-day? Uh, I do. You know, if we steal two or, th two or three days off each one. Yeah. Everybody still gets a little Monday, break, but then. Town meeting makes sense. If they're going to go to town meeting, they might as well go to Monday. They still have the week off. Yeah. John, go ahead. So I came late because I was watching a basketball game. Um, how many days do we have to make up? So it depend, depends on tech center or depends on high school. High school, we've got to make up nine, tech center three. Um, the tech center, I'm actually going to talk with the staff over there. I may just see if I can get a waiver for the three days because it's, it's minimal. Um, the high school is a little bit more problematic because of the number of days. I don't think they'll waive that many days. My suggestion would be to, to next February vacation because uh, then you still have Christmas in April. Um, and then I'd, I'd add a week in June or do Saturdays. So one of the things that we had talked about um, was this idea of the matrix of things that we could possibly do. 
Um, the biggest thing, and we'll have to do a survey afterwards, we've got to make sure that if, if and when we make a decision on what days we want to do, we've got to get 50% of the students to show up. Uh, otherwise, we burn a, te uh, a teacher day and we don't get a count for a student day. And if we get them out of whack, we'll get ourselves in a position where we can't meet the 175-day requirement. So it's, okay, so the February, so all of February vacation? I just mix it. And then I add on the end. Other thoughts that folks have? Just that that sounds risky from what we talked about earlier because of the senior graduation and they're not attending in later in June. Yeah. Then we run a higher risk of not meeting the requirements. So, so here's the pro and con piece, um, right? If, if we miss days and we don't make them up, it's learning that doesn't happen. That, that was one of my con comments was, you know, I would really appreciate if the kids are going to be here, they, they make up that time yep. to actually learn. Yep. Yep. And if it's going to be some type of a special project or something like that, we might as well write the day off and let them go do what they want. But if they have, you know, there's got to be something in that curriculum where they yeah, missed. It, it, it'll be, and I really want them, I mean, yeah, and so that's what I'm saying. Like, if we're not going to actually do, have them do classes, try to get the waiver and don't do it. But you know, I think if they're going to do it, they should be instructed and make the time well worth it. Is if we're giving up Saturdays and, and vacation days, it should be worth them being here. Is there value, however, in terms of the seniors of giving them that break, or should they serve that time as well? So in other words, I could potentially ask for a waiver just for the seniors. Again, I don't know what they'll grant. Um, they, I had one that I had to, a waiver I had to put in. I think it was my first year here when the water main broke in, in uh, Braintree. Uh, they gave us that one. We had another similar circumstance that happened the year after. They said no, and it didn't really make any sense because the circumstances were kind of the same. I mean, I, I could definitely understand that with, with the seniors, you know, especially if we have to push out a couple days <clears throat> for the, the rest of the students. They let off, you know, two, three days for the seniors. Yep. That sounds more than reasonable. But I would just say, like, I think Lisa mentioned about having some type of a special project on a Saturday for them. I don't know if that's really, I, I think they should be concentrating on their core classes and really doing the instruction. If it's just trying to fill the time, I don't think that's worth it. No, that. And I, I'm in agreement um, on the core class piece if we're going to do this, um, just because that learning, it's a lot of learning to lose nine days. Um, uh, uh, thoughts? And I have a, a couple of questions. Um, yeah. What about, so, so the way we're looking at this, I mean, there's a semester here, <clears throat> and the students have lost learning in their semester classes on this semester. <clears throat> and if we tack on things, I think what the semester ends in theory in the end of January or somewhere. I forget the timing of that. Yeah. And so they go into new classes. They've missed the learning in the classes that they had that other semester if they're you know in split semesters. And so how are they going to make up the learning for the class that they're no longer in? So usually, yeah. usually the focus is is on the core. Okay. Right? So you know your math, science, ELA, social studies. Um, foreign language. So, so pretty much they just lose, they're just... It's, okay, an, they're it's just an extra curriculum. They don't have to, but that's that's a worthy, you know, thing for us to, to talk a little bit about here. Um, we can try to figure out a way to have the students make that up if it's of value for an elective. Yeah. I will just mention that um, there are all, there is at least one core class that is semester split, um, yeah. so that would be affected. Which one's that? Uh, Economics and sociology. Oh, the uh, yeah, that makes sense because those are the social studies. So I don't know if that means you need to think about extending this semester a little bit as part of thinking about it. I don't, I don't know. And good luck, uh, you know, <laughs> that's you. But um, the other question that I have is, if you went on a Saturday route, I'm going to assume that there will be some kind of bus slash transportation. Yeah. Um, but that would not include the little ones, and so that would be a completely different kind of bus route, right? I mean, we're all the way at the end in Brookfield, right? And so it's a it's a long long haul for for Sierra. So she's going to be the only person on the bus, right? You know, how many like 
So obviously transportation has to factor into this as well. Yeah, remember we didn't have to pay for the, the buses during. So well, it's not but, like we're losing money to run them on. But they were still running because of the elementary for the school. For the elementary, right. yeah. <clears throat> but not, not the same routes that they normally do. Um, and that's, it's, uh, even with the gas prices up a little bit, that, that, that's not going to be a big factor here. Okay. Uh, but that's a good point to bring up. Yeah. Now, we talk, talked a little bit about it. Once, um, once we kind of have a plan for the days, we'll talk with Danny, the transportation director, and he's really good at kind of working out the best routes. Because the other thing, too, is you, know, you, want the, you don't want the kids on the buses any longer than they have to be. Um, in terms of how they set it up. He, he's done a pretty good job of trying to keep him to 30 minutes or less. Um, other thoughts, other ideas on? I know this came up a little before, but I just feel compelled to say that the teachers need to be on board with whatever is decided. Yeah. I mean, if I were a teacher and I was told, oh, the community wants you to teach on Saturdays, I would not be happy. Oh, yeah. at all <laughs> so I just I need well, to get that out there there's the piece with the teachers too that we've got to take into account is a lot of them have little ones at home yep. and we got to yeah, be cognizant absolutely. of the fact yep. that they need daycare and they need yeah. yep. and so that's something depending upon what what folks are agreeable to is something that we may have to buy or like losing an entire break like that would yep. not really be something I would yeah. be happy about there's a little there's a little more <clears throat> to it, I mean, they, they have signed a contract for 185 days. Um, those days, you know, can be compelled to be served. I don't want to go that way. Right. So what, what we'll do, um, probably in the middle of the vacation, of course that may not be the best time because people won't be around, so maybe we'll do it right after the vacation, is we, we got to get a survey out. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll break things down between, okay, students, um, community members slash parents and teachers. These are the possibilities, rate them. You know, what's, what's your number one choice? What's your number two? You know, do you want a combo? I mean, it just—it seems to me that a combo is probably going to be the way to be able to spread the pain out equally, yeah. so that you know, you take a little bit from here. Maybe there's one Saturday, or maybe two Saturdays, but Wait not a couple bunch days of Saturdays. Maybe you know, the February and the April breaks are shortened by you know, uh, we're here for two days and we get three days off. Um, you know, maybe there's a couple weeks where we go a little bit longer, and then that way you're kind of spreading it out so that you're not fully impacting the kids in sports, but maybe a little, <laughs> and then the kids in other extracurricular activities, maybe a little, some Saturdays, and I just, that's going to spread it out. I'd like to think that most people would be like, okay, you know, we can deal with this, you know, a little bit here or there, and same for the teachers. And we're not really a representative group in here, but no. how many how many folks work on a weekend? Typically, students so do. There are a couple. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> students do. Yeah. So I think adding to the end of the school day, then if you're worried about the fifty percent, like if you're cutting out their vacation days or requiring them to come on Saturdays, I think you're less likely to get. 50%, whereas if you add a little bit to the end of the school day, you've already got most of them here anyway. So even if there are a couple who are like, I don't want to do this, and they cut out because they can drive, so they leave, you've still had more than 50% here for a majority of the day, so I assume that still counts as a school day, yeah. rather than people on Saturdays being, I know my kids were like adamantly against Saturdays. I, I haven't had I haven't added it up. Um, it is possible. Again, it's a long way of doing things. So right, if we got to make up nine days, we add an hour to each day. It takes five five of those or or five and a half of those days to, to get us to count. But if town meeting day is already one, Martin Luther there's, there's three down, so we get down to town meeting day. And if you're going to so get rid of town meeting day, you might as well get rid of that Monday. So that's. Not don't lose your time. It's not a week and a half this year. It's the February break, then we go back the week, and then we have this Tuesday. <clears throat> they, so they go on Monday and then not Tuesday? Yes. So we're March. February and March. There we go. So, we so we're go going on the 21st. We're back a week, almost. We have here on Monday, and we only have Tuesday half the time. Okay. But yeah. in your in your calculation, uh, you've already calculated for putting uh, Martin Luther King Day and Town yeah. Meeting Day so back. There's, there's two days back. Right. Yeah, but we're still. Li you're saying even with those two days back, um, seven. Seven? I thought, I thought you said nine. nine at the beginning. I thought it was nine. 
Yeah. Was that, that? You're right. That, yeah, that was nine, eleven. Two days. Yeah, it was eleven originally. Yeah. 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 So so I mean, so we're still at nine days even when we yeah. do take those. And that's assuming we don't have any more yeah. snow days. So we we need we need about 40, 40 extended you know days to be able to pull this off. If the state board doesn't get us till you know end of February, if I don't get a response to March, we may not have you know forty days in the regular school year to be able to hit that are left at that point in time. Oh. Um, but that's something I can count up afterwards. Actually, you will, because uh, it says it right at the end. It's twenty-two yeah. days in March, twenty fifteen, 22, and twenty-two, and uh, yeah, May. so I consist of the forty. So we we could do it, but it'd be every day. But so. we don't even know if they would prove that. Yeah. And but, but what I'll do is, um, at least in the survey, I'll put it on as you know one of the options for folks to rate. Um, well, and maybe they'd be willing to waive for all the students three days. Yeah. Right? And so maybe you can get well, I'm going to ask them to waive all of them and then kind of figure out where people are. Yeah, let's just so I have flexibility, but then it's okay. Yes, um, if they waive all of them, how many days does the community want us to make up? Because we do not want to disrupt the learning anymore right. than we need to because it, it's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You had your hand up. Um, I don't know what's already been suggested, but in terms of Saturdays, um, I think it might be better if we didn't, if we push back the start of the school day. Yep. Um, I just know, like, I I'll think I'll myself. Back the, the, the students we were talking to earlier, they were talking like 9, 10 o'clock. I think that would be better because yeah, that would I think that would be uh, encourage more kids to go so that we could meet the fifty percent. Um, also, in um, April break, um, there is the Morocco trip, which I know at least potentially up to twelve students would be going and two teachers. Um, so, like, I mean. I don't know, like, we obviously won't be in school, but we will be, the idea was we would miss two days uh, before the break, and then the rest would all be during the break. But if we're, I mean, we're in Morocco, we're still, you know, you know, doing stuff, yeah. learning, but we wouldn't be here at the school. So I don't know if there's any way that would count or. Yeah, they're, they're, they're curriculum days. You're, you're engaged in, in school curriculum. Okay. Any any other thoughts as we kind of close this up? So, Van, are you saying regardless of what we do with this calendar, graduation is not moving from the 16th? Or are you not saying that? I'm a little bit confused about that. So, the the question that we have out there again, there, there's pros and cons to whatever we do. If if we waive days, students miss out on learning. That, that that's important. Um, but. That might be acceptable given our circumstances. That's a community decision that has to be made. It is possible that we keep graduation right where it is. Um, and then as part of the waiver process, process um, I asked for a full waiver for the, the seniors. So when will you have like that answer? Because I feel like graduation is kind of a big deal for people coming into town and yep. to do a lot of things. So it's controlled by uh, the state school board under the regulations. They are not allowed to even consider waiver requests until their meeting in February. And it scared the pants off me because they had some ambiguous language in there that seems to suggest, um, though I got some clarification on it with the secretary, that seems to suggest that any days that are missed prior to February cannot be waived. And so I'm hoping that that doesn't come back and, yeah. If my math is right, when we come back from Christmas break, um, you go till the end of March if you added an hour a day. And that would make up your nine days. Uh, so we need, so. And that would still leave the February break there. So each, uh, your map may be right, my head's going to hit a little bit of the fog, like so I'm going to the cold. 5.5 um, hours of additional instruction time would equal one school day. I was using six hours, yeah, so which that, was the end of March. Yeah, so it's possible. But you can't get that approved until February. Can't get that approved until they're born. So, the, and it, so it'll <laughs> probably, they'll, they'll meet mid, they'll meet mid-February. I'll, I'll probably get the letter from them first, first week of March. And then is transportation an issue? 
Nah, we, we can cover that. Well, we could, we could, you know, if, if the town decided that they wanted to do some Saturdays and stuff um, after the survey, we could do that. You could still have it. We could, we could add it. Well, that has to be approved by the board as well. But then you just do it March, April, May then. Yeah. It's three months wherever you, wherever you put it. Yeah. But, you know, if people decided that they wanted to steal maybe two days off of February or all of February break, you know, we could do that and kill, kill that off uh, before we get a, an answer from them. Because that doesn't require them to approve. Uh, so some good thoughts. Yeah, it's not a lot of fun. Thankfully, it wasn't more days. It was looking like it was going to be three months, and moving, moving the students around was not going to be a, a good time. There would have been no learning that went on. That was the problem with it. No, very glad we got back in the building. Yeah. So I do, let's I talk a little bit on budget. We don't have to go into real details, um, but it's kind of, kind of a requirement. Um, and it's good to start getting the word out as we get kind of prepared for the March vote. But before we do that, any last final thoughts that people want me to take down kind of surrounding? I'll uh, just say, uh, Give you a little heads up that uh, Miss Johnson actually held their AP class, AP physics classes over the break. They met at the uh, town hall, yeah. and uh, I just want to say thank you to her for putting that effort in yeah, no, to do that. She's awesome. It's it's fun to actually see her with kids. So I I really like that was to see that happen because. Um, yeah, those uh, those the AP exams. Um, especially the teachers that have done it for a long time. You know, a lot of them will actually do Saturday, depending upon how the kids are testing prior yeah. to their exam. You know, they'll do Saturday sessions and things with them as well. It's kind of neat to see. Yeah? I think we should make up the time by sending all the students to Morocco with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the old, uh, it used to, my, my day, they used to all go out to the Bahamas for uh, marine science for the summer. Which is kind of fun. <clears throat> All right, let me see. Yeah, class each do a class trip for a Saturday. I mean, we don't do any class trips. We we've had some discussions um, about this idea. You know, this kind of goes back to you know the community building and whatnot. Um, you know, one of the best ways to build community, which is what you're touching on, is building some traditions, right? things that we do every year, and so that's certainly something that, that we can consider. Did they ever have one, folks that were here, you know, in our alumni? For, for the... Yeah, Morocco. just a class trip. <clears throat> the, the Morocco trip, yeah, that was a regular thing that actually was supposed to happen in 2020, and then it had been all planned, and they were planning on leaving a few weeks before everything shut down, so... But that's um, that's not for everybody in the class. Usually, it's just those that participate in the, um, the foreign exchange through the foreign language. Yeah. Yeah. So. So a class trip was like, you know, when I grew up in Maryland, when I was in elementary school, you know, you got the got the fifth grade. Everybody went and spent the day in New York City at the Empire State Building. You know, when you're in sixth grade, you spent um, a, a day or two in Washington, going to the Smithsonian Institute, that sort of stuff, and those would take everybody. It was kind of a, like a nice uh, building experience because the, the best way for people to understand themselves is just to spend time with each other, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they, they are good things. And it is one of the ideas that came up at the discussion that the cabinet's been kind of talking about. Um, it's an expectation that even before uh, we had the discussion around, you know, transgender youth and whatnot, um, because those sorts of traditions also built uh, increased engagement with the district, right? Students um, are more likely to feel positively towards school, more likely to attend, more likely to, to, to work hard. So those will be ongoing discussions, and it's great that you brought that up because it really does fit in well with everything. Um, all right, so uh, budget-wise, a little bit, and I'm not going to go into any more detail than you want me to. Um, other than to say that, yes, uh, given inflation and everything else, costs have gone up exponentially. Um, but we've got, done a good job on the revenue side as well. Our revenues actually exceed our additional costs. Um, so right now, depending upon what the legislature decides to do with the surplus funds that it has in the Ed Fund, 
Um, if they do what everybody is recommending them to, um, it will be about a million dollars less in terms of what we will be asking from the taxpayers this year. Um, but to kind of talk a little bit about this because um, it's important, it gives folks an idea of the things that we are actually working on and kind of focusing on, especially in terms of academics, what we're trying to accomplish for kids um, as we kind of go through this. The big thing about this, now that I'm getting my voice moving a little bit here, is uh, I'm going to talk fairly fast because some of it may have no meaning to folks or, or things that you don't care too much about. But if there is something there, just interrupt me and ask the questions um, that you've got. So in terms of the numbers that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight and, and why those numbers exist, um, a couple of things to be aware of. We do not have all the data at this point in time that we need from the state to be able to actually calculate what your actual taxes are going to be um, next year. The common level of appraisals have not come out yet. And then the other big piece is that we have a surplus at the end of every school year. There's always money left over in the budget. Um, I typically have been doing a couple of things with that. Um, I'll either roll it forward so that it helps subsidize taxes in the, in the coming year. Um, and sometimes we'll actually ask the voters to actually put it in reserve funds so that we have money available to do things like repair the heat when big things blow up and I don't have to go out to bond or, or go out and um, ask for loans. Um, that information on what our surplus was uh, should be coming by hopefully the end of December. All right, we have auditors that check our books every year and they're the ones that tell us what it is and that's the number that we have to use. So uh, we don't know at this point in time um, impact of negotiations with teachers and, su and the support staff unit. Um, you know, that could be, be bring things up, could bring things down. It all depends on how that, that works out, what we all decide upon. Um, I did take a strong look at where negotiations are ending in the districts that have already settled because that's the basis which if we end up like with the union going to uh, arbitration, that's what the arbitrator uses. They'll look around at the other districts, see what they settled at in terms of a percent increase, and then that's what they'll expect us to do as well. So I have built enough into the budget to take those considerations into account. Um, the big question here is that the state has $64 million in surplus that was left over from last year, um, and whether or not they are going to roll it into this year's Ed Fund. Everybody is recommending that they do that, but once the legislative session starts, they may have other ideas. One of those ideas may be the, the continuation of the universal school lunches, which would take between 20 and 32 million out of that. We don't know what the surplus is um, yet um, that might be able to be rolled into this next year to help subsidize taxes further, um, but it is around a million dollars, give or take. That, that I can tell you. So we've done a pretty good job there. As I said, we don't know the common level of appraisals yet. Uh, those should be out any day now. Um, but the one thing that the state budget office has said is that on average folks can expect an 8.5 or higher increase in expenses uh, across the board just because of inflation and things that are happening in the economy. On the revenue side of things, the money that we bring in, uh, we've actually done really, really well. In terms of the, the census block grant, um, the state had changed how we get paid to support our special education students. Um, we will actually be receiving almost a quarter million more than we did in previous years. Um, the equalized pupils, uh, this is also called the, uh, relates to the yield. Um, we are going to be getting an additional 1.7 million from the um, state education fund. Um, each year we have a number, a large number of students that actually tuition into our district to go to school here. Um, last year we had $465,000 worth of tuition in students. That number seem, it seems to be going up every year. So we expect it for next year to be about Does the same. Does that number include our TCC kids? Because when you send that number out, I'm never understanding where all of that's going from. Uh, which one? The tuition in. So, uh, no, we actually, the, the RTCC kids from the district perspective, we are two separate entities, so it's a good question. We actually, that's tuition out money. We actually pay tuition for our students to go to RTCC. So kids like from Williamstown or South Wales that come to RTCC, 
they don't, that, that, is, that is literally kids within this high school? Uh, not just the high school, we have people that pay tuition to go to our elementaries as well. Yeah. And that number's been going up. It uh, started out three, four years ago. Uh, it was about a 200,000, and it's been slowly growing even through COVID. So that's been, been kind of nice. Um, the operational fund subsidy, what I was doing um, during the COVID years was, because we didn't know what the financial future was going to look like in the country, given the fact that we were going through the pandemic. Every year that we had a surplus, we had money left over at the end of the budget year. I put it into a fund that was specifically designed to use in future years to help um, subsidize people's taxes, bring your taxes down. So next year, um, the amount that is set aside for that right, in, right now is 746000 And then we also have the surplus, and some of that money will also be used to help to subsidize taxes. I just can't tell you what it is now because I don't have a, a final figure on it. So we're doing really well uh, on the revenue side. A little more details here, kind of general expenses. Um, one of the things about coming into this district was there were a lot of things that this district did not do that normal schools do. Um, they did not have, for the most part, specific programs. In a lot of cases, they didn't even have textbooks. And so some of the work over the last couple of years has been getting the right people in the right places to do the work that we need to do. And now we are focusing on making sure that people have the supplies and the materials they need to actually serve the students well in the classes. So over the course of the last couple of years, we brought in Carnegie Math for grades 6 to 12. Um, it has a, a yearly cost of about $37,000 um, ongoing. So that's being added to the budget to make sure that it's there. Your robotics, both the uh, in-school program and the after-school program are in this number to help to support that. We built a half a million dollar uh, robotics program, STEM program at the high school over the last couple of years. Um, in terms of supporting English, uh, you know, reading and writing, and this is K to 12. Um, you know, we're bringing in a couple of really well-researched program, uh, programs on geodes, wit and wisdom and foundations. And that will have an ongoing cost of 25000 a year. And these are normal numbers that districts pay. Um, there's consumables. Um, there's replacements that have to happen every year to keep these programs going. Um, most districts probably are spending about a quarter of a million dollars or more on the, the, the replacement materials um, for their, their programs. We just didn't have them. Um, we're investigating a, a thing called Project Lead the Way, which is an engineering curriculum that is online um, as a further expansion of the STEM program. Uh, the health uh, teachers um, have been doing some amazing work in terms of setting up the, the curriculum as we do the curriculum work this year. But there is the LEAD program that is out there that is kind of a, a gold standard. Um, so they're asking for materials to be able to enhance that, that program uh, within the district. We have two K-12 curriculum directors, one for math and one for um, English language arts. They need some time um, to actually prepare uh, the trainings and things that they engage the staff with uh, so that they're learning what they need to do to provide the best delivery um, of these subjects to the students. So this is for a little bit of extra time over the summer for them to do that work. We've built in what's called a boot camp. Um, so what we do is when we have our new teachers come in every year, we spend a week or a little bit more than that with them. Um, and we get our teachers in, they act as the trainers, and they train all the new staff and all the new initiatives that they're working on so that the new staff can hit the ground running doing as well a job with the students as, as everybody else that's here. Um, another kind of new expense, obviously, is the gasoline prices have gone up. So another 30000 um, for next year. Uh, to be able to cover that increased expense in, in gas. I think, I don't remember the actual percentage that, that, that we were anticipating uh, for the diesel fuel, but it's about, about 30 grand. This one ties into a bunch of uh, programs that we are currently working on with the leadership team, um, trying to get an activity bus back in um, to the, the roundup for two reasons. Um, we have a homework policy that we are in the middle of creating. Um, we actually had the first feedback session from the cabinet today. It'll be going out to the staff to take a look at. Um, 
in starting this up because homework has not traditionally been a part of this district. So it's one of those norms um, that this district has not had for some reason for time out of mind. Um, but it's critically important in terms of student learning to be able to support the transition from going to very little or none to actually having a very solid homework program, we have to provide supports to kids and families so that they can acquire the skills, acquire the routines um, for a couple of years before we expect them to be able to manage it on their own. So the activity buses will allow us to use the after school programs at the elementary schools. Um, to turn them into more of an academic uh, environment so that the students that aren't getting the homework done or they need some skills and some training on how to, how to manage it uh, can go there and they can complete that work. Um, and the same thing kind of at the high school. Um, high school we're planning a little bit on um, more of kind of like a Saturday academic day. They're a little bit more mentally developed students. Saturdays are going to be a little tougher on them. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more motivating about keeping up on the work that they're supposed to do. So questions on this, like I said, I'm going through it rather fast. Uh, big thing to take away is there's a significant amount of work that's going on in the district in terms of academic achievement. Um, preschool, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've worked very hard to build a full day preschool for four-year-olds that is cost-free um, to the families that is in place. We are currently trying to expand um, the preschool hours for three-year-olds, right? The four-year-old preschool adds a whole additional extra year of education to our students than they had before. The three-year-old program will help a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, and we are also bringing in and investigating some, some curriculums um, to help the kids get the basic skills that they need so that they can hit the ground running in kindergarten and at least in the early grades. Uh, when they get going. So we will be hiring a, a para for Brookfield to support the preschool program. Um, that person was uh, originally had been paid out of um, grants uh, for a while, but the grants end after three years, so it's now it's time that we got the program built to bring over to the regular budget. <coughs> Braintree, um, you're going to see we're trying to increase the amount of time that our librarians are with the students used to be one day a week, now it's two days a week. We're trying to get them up to three days a week. It's out of a recognition that the elementary teachers um, do not get the type of planning time that happens at the high school. Um, so they're gonna serve two purposes uh, while the kids are with the, the library media specialists um, learning the digital literacy curriculum that we've created. Um, the teachers will have some planning time to be able to sit down and kind of talk about curriculum, talk about their assignments, uh, take a look at assessments, find out where the kids are strong and weak and adjust their instruction to kind of match. Um, academic interventionist, um, we have a person who's a point eight. We don't want to lose them. We'll bring them up to point two. These are folks that work with regular education students that are struggling. And in the case of the elementary, they can do both math and ELA support. Um, Brookfield, same, same thing, small school. We're just trying to bring the library media specialist up to three days a week to help out with that, that planning for the elementary teachers. Randolph Elementary, and this is a, a record breaker because this has never happened in the history of humankind. Um, there are no additions. Um, they're, they're usually the biggest, so I, I gotta give them a lot of credit. Um, high school, <clears throat> uh, drug and alcohol counselor, um, we were gonna increase, we, we had a half-time person here um, we're increasing it to full time. There were a lot of impacts on the students um, during the COVID pandemic, especially in terms of social isolation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of extra trauma that they suffered in the home. It caused a dramatic increase in vaping, drugs, and alcohol use. And so it seems kind of um, intuitive to try to increase our, our drug and alcohol counselor here to, to try to help manage that situation. Um, Gifford has actually been very helpful too, especially on the vaping. There's a, a cessation program that they run within the district. We've also revamped the high school handbook um, as you know, we work a little bit more on the discipline, you know, the restorative justice versus the consequences. We're focusing a little bit more on the consequence side now. Um, but one of the things is that you know, if you get busted twice with, with vape, one of the expectations is, is to earn your place back and you, you need to go to a cessation program um, if you're under age. Um, life skills program, um, we had a good start to it. The conversations have been continuing in different, different venues and different groups. 
Um, lately, we've been meeting with small groups of students and advisories to get their input. Um, we are planning on doing some shifting of teaching resources to provide the bodies to be able to deliver on the life skills program next year and adding a little bit of money um, for some of the trips and uh, the field trips that we expect that the students will be taking as a part of that. Um, career expert, exploration, that's Jason Finley. Um, he does a lot of work with students, getting them to kind of go out, get a feel in the field for what, you know, if I'm interested in being an engineer, what does that mean? Um, getting them out to do a field trip to see, see what the job looks like, as well as internships, and so they need a little bit more money for transportation. And then the Saturday detention piece that we already kind of talked a little bit about. If we've got students that are getting behind, these aren't meant so much to be disciplinary in nature, but if you are behind and we have assigned you work, and it is important work for you to get done, we care about you too much to let this just go by. Um, we're gonna have you, pull you in on a Saturday, have you work um, with one or two of the teachers that'll be there um, to get you caught up. And hopefully over the course of a, a couple of years, the culture will become that the students just begin to do it on their own. Uh, special education is difficult um, this year. Again, we got a, a major increase uh, from the state under the block grant, about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, but we're spending a little bit more than that. Um, and a lot of it, again, is due to um, social is isolation of the kids during COVID. There's a lot of behavioral problems we're seeing um, coming in. And they're different ones than we've seen before. Um, a lot of them are, are at the level that they are a disability. Um, so we need a, need a paraeducator to work with one of our students that, that's really tough. We expect that we're going to be tuitioning uh, a couple of students out next year, students whose disabilities are such that we cannot accommodate their behaviors here. Um, so we get them out into specialized programs for a little while. Hopefully they can get the students back up to where they need to be so that we can have them back. Um, transportation to get the students back and forth to where we're tuitioning them out to. And then um, OT is a new one. Um, a lot of students with developmental disabilities um, especially with hands that need work, just even being able to hold a pencil and things like that. Um, so that's going to be one that we haven't seen before. Um, we had been cited by the state as having too many kids that needed uh, speech and language work, um, speech and language pathology work, um, too many kids on IEPs for it. And so in working with the state, the solution was, is okay, We'll hire a new uh, speech person, we'll have them come in and we'll have them work with the students in the preschool to identify them early if they're having problems because it's a heck of a lot easier to remediate those problems at that, that age than it is to not pick it up until they're in sixth grade when they've developed those problems quite severely. Um, so this is to prevent students from, from getting on the IEPs in the first place. We have been paying for that person out of a grant, it's now time to move them over to the regular budget. And we have two students that are coming in with um, severe uh, visual disabilities that, that need specialized equipment. Contracted kind of mandatory obligations. I split our new expenses, the new things that we're spending on, into two categories. They're what's discretionary. Those are things that we can do or not do, right? Buying textbooks, um, adding in the Carnegie Math Program. Those are things that are a choice. Um, we have things that we have no choice on, um, either because the, the contracts with the various uh, groups in terms of our staff require it, um, or it's just things that we have to supply to run the school, like, right, we've got to pay for heating oil, we've got to pay for electricity. So um, projected salary increases uh, across the district next year is an additional $889,000. That's what we're projecting based upon what's happening in other districts. Health insurance went up 12.7% this year, so that's an additional 269,000 that we're gonna need. Um, based upon what we're seeing um, for the additional cost for supplies, just to get the same amount of supplies that we had last year um, into the schools and maintain things, it's an additional 116,000 because of inflation. Heating, right, the heating oil prices have gone up and then our other utilities. Um, this is what we were talking about a little little while ago when you asked the question about the tech center, right? Um, they are tuition out students. If the cost of their tuition goes up, we pay more. Um, and because we send, you know, 65 kids a year to the tech center, it can be significantly more. 
their tuition is going to go up based upon some of the things that the state wants them to do. The overall impact of that tuition increase to the, the district, the OSSD, is going to be an additional 205000 So discretionary versus mandated. The blue is discretionary. Those are things we could cut if we had to. The orange is mandated. There is no choice. Right? To get an idea of what the breakdown is. Bottom line, new expenses for next year. And again, it's an expensive year across the board um, because of what's happened uh, after COVID in terms of inflation and whatnot. 2.24 million, which is a huge number. But our new revenue is at least 3.1 you know, million. So we're actually bringing in much more than the additional amount that we're going to be spending. Um, so technically, you know, if everything stays the same here, we're going to be asking for 900000 almost a million dollars less than um, what we did last year for the taxpayers. What does that mean? Um, if the common level of appraisals stay the same as they were last year, which they very well might, um, everybody's school taxes should go down by five cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. Um, so if you have an average home um, at this price right here, that's what the average price of homes are in Vermont, you'd save about $180 on your school taxes. Um, so the big, the big budget uh, overview. Again, some of these numbers are going to change. The two biggest things that we worry about is if the legislature starts to mess with that $64 million surplus and put it someplace else. It's possible that they're getting a lot of grief not to, so we're keeping our fingers crossed. The other piece that is not included in here is how much um, I'm going to take from the surplus once we know what that number is uh, and add it to our revenue. So this number may be higher. So a lot of, a lot of facts and figures and numbers and thoughts and talks, a little bit of a talk about programs, but um, questions on any of this. So those numbers don't include either of the surpluses, whether it's at the state level or the district surplus. So this, it's not including the, the most recent district surplus, because yep. we, until the auditors get done, we don't know what it is. It, it should be coming any time now, usually right after vacation. Um, the state surplus, that $64 million, it's assuming that all of that is put into the education fund. That's what they said they're going to do. That's what everybody Okay, so those numbers you have there are assuming that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, they're, they're as accurate as what we've been told so far. Again, they're, they're, they're not in bad shape considering, you know, the economy right now. It's getting a little bit better, but, you know, that can change on a dime. So, it's not a bad year. We're able to kind of increase, increase spending to support our, and enhance kind of our academic programs for students um, and still have enough extra coming in to cover the, those additional expenses. Once the CLA comes out, um, and once we know the surplus, I'll redo these. And typically what I'll do is at a, a future meeting prior to the March vote, is I'll be able to say by town, you know, what you can expect on an average price home um, to happen to your taxes. So, thoughts and questions? Going along with that, I appreciate you just sticking with me. I'm happy to talk about anything else. Well, while we're here, nobody's locked here. People can stay and hang out. I usually hang out until the questions peter out. I just wanted to say that I appreciate the, the emphasis on, on growing the academic quality here and, and really thinking about ways to um, have a culture of, you know, understanding homework, understanding, you know, the need to do some of these things to, to be a stronger student. And I appreciate seeing that show up in the budget. Yeah. So the, the homework, homework piece is key. It's something, you know, even Brian, you know, going, going back, it was difficult to bring in until now because we needed to have the curriculum documents done, which are now almost complete across the board. They'll all be posted on the, on the website. And one of the reasons for it is um, when you look at a, a curriculum like math, right, you've got a second grade curriculum, a third grade curriculum, what you want to have happen is you want the third grade teachers to take a look at the second grade curriculum and say, okay, of everything that you teach, what are the six or seven things that are the most important? And so once those are identified, uh, we know that those are areas that those teachers should be doing a little bit of extra work. So, you know, part of the homework policy is if you've got uh, foundational standards, there will be homework 
It will be well thought out, it will be quality, and so part of that policy really describes what quality homework is, what the expectations are. Um, it's not about time. Um, time doesn't matter as much as the quality of the assignments that the kids are given. Um, there will also be what are called targeted standards um, that will be in those documents uh, that the teachers will identify when they do their data analysis. And those are the usually the bottom six or seven standards. You know, the, those are the ones that the kids perform the most poorly on. And so those will have additional assignments and work attached to them so that we're, we're specifically addressing those needs. Um, and so that's kind of where we are in the process. After the homework, um, protocols are out and people have had some chance to put some feedback on, in on them and we've had a chance to kind of do some professional development around it. We've also got to do some PD with, this, with the actual parents, mm -hmm. you know, hey, if this is going to work, we need your support too, so these are things that you can do to help us, um, you know, get this off the ground and get it running. Then it's taking a look at, a, at, a, at assessment protocols. We, we don't test. You know, there's, there's good things and there's bad things about tests, but one of the things that I can say about tests when they happen regularly and it's well defined in the research is that if every two or three weeks the, the kids are, are, are taking a test, um, they actually learn while they're taking the test. It's one more time that information is going through their brains. Um, they make a whole bunch of additional connections with the information of what they already know. And you get this kind of exponential growth in their knowledge base when they do that. So that's going to be the, the next piece that's coming along. So we're, we're slowly getting, getting there. Um, a lot of it was building the infrastructure the first couple of years and then getting blown out of the water for three years with COVID um, and trying to get through. We, Brookfield still doesn't have any homework. Mm -hmm. Brookfield nope. Elementary has zero homework. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the reason, one of the reasons that that policy piece is going into place. Um, so I spent the last week or so hitting the research base and, and pulling all the best pieces together. Like I said, we had the, the curriculums are developed enough, we can now address this piece of, of, I've got this gigantic, what I call the education plan, that's got eight, eight stages to it. This is one of the stages, that's the stage we're on right now. Um, so hopefully what will happen is the expectation is by the end of the year, the homework will start happening. Next year, during some of the professional development time, the teachers will spend it to actually make sure that that homework is of high quality. <clears throat> so that the, it's really just, it's pared down to what the kids need to, to get the most, most out of it without spending you know, any more time than they need to. It would be nice to see consistency here as the, as the kids grow older, because mm -hmm. like right now there's like in the elementary, good amount of homework, and then middle school it drops off, and then high school hits, and like, oh, it's like a, yeah. Like a yo yo for some of the kids. So it'd be good to see kind of a steady. And, and you can, as you look at that pattern, as you, as you look at that train of students as they you know, progress from elementary to middle to high school, if they're not doing regular homework at elementary, mm -hmm. even though homework looks different in the elementary school, how can we say that we prepared them to have the skills to do it independently when you know, they get to high school and when they get to middle school, which is why it's so important? And so those are, those are the discussions um, that we're having. You know, a lot of the, the elementary stuff, it actually should be fun stuff. It would be, especially for the, the lower elementary grades, it's calling the parents in for a parent evening and here are the math games. We'll give you the math games. We'll spend a night. We'll show you how to play them with your, with your kids and go home. And we expect you, you know, spend 15 minutes a night on this for this week. And then, you know, uh, six weeks later when things change over, it's the, it's the word, word games. Um, and those are real important in our community for two reasons. It's not just the academic side that the students are picking up on, right? They're, they're getting a chance to really kind of rethink the things they're learning in school and see them in different ways and, and kind of build upon that learning. But it's also the fact that we have a community to a great part where the parents are disconnected from their children. And so if we can build things in place like that where the the parents are actually going home doing something fun with the kids while they're still learning. They might actually develop some stronger relationships with their own children and that's going to solve some of the climate problems that we've had. That was kind of the exact rationale as to why we were told that they did away with homework because they used to do homework there and then we were told that there are enough parents who will commit to spending that time helping their children so it wasn't fair to give homework because some people didn't have the family support. It's an excuse. Well, and that excuse yeah. did not come from the teachers. That excuse came from the administrators at the time. I know because I fought them for three years about. Well, then that's well, that came from <laughs> one teacher. 
What's that job? One teacher. I remember, I remember having that exactly. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's where you're right. But the reason that the activity bus is there is because we know that people aren't going to get this up front. So you provide the supports. It's the scaffolding, right? If we expect you to do this, you know, we first introduce it, show you how to do it. The activity, activity time after school is for us to do what's called the guided practice sessions. We're helping folks figure this out. And eventually, sometime down the road, two or three years, it's now all on the parents and the kids because we've given you the skills and what you needed. Will all parents do it? No. But most will. And, you know, you, you can't expect things to be perfect, but, you know, if we can get 50%, 60% of the parents doing this with their, with their, with their children... That, that's can't a hold huge. all the kids back for some parents. No, no. But uh, you know, if we if we have those those after school uh, academics and the and, you know the Saturday academic days, it makes a difference. I, I've seen it in other districts, um, so I'm kind of excited about it. Well, it's about creating opportunities for access. Yeah. And the more we can do that, we create an equitable playing uh -huh. field for all of our kids. Well, the the equity piece is interesting because that logic. I understand why folks would say it, but it's actually turned upside down. Mm -hmm. The equity piece with, with homework, especially as you get to like the middle school and the high, high school level, is that when you assign the homework, it's got to be at the edge of what students are, are currently capable of and learning, because that's what helps them advance a little bit. Um, it has to be something that they can do independently on their own without parent help. Mm -hmm. Why? That's the equity piece. Because some parents are not able to or willing to help their kids while others are. Mm -hmm. And that is inequitable. Yeah. Um, so when you get to that, that middle school level, you get to that high school level, that's the expectation is that you know the kids can do this independently on their own. And they've got some perseverance and some resilience that, hey, if I can't figure it out, what do I do? Well, you call up call up your best friend who's in the same class with you and you talk with them about it. That's the perseverance piece that, that we've got to start to train them to do too. So that, and that self-reliance, because we want them to be independent at those ages. Mm -hmm. So good conversation. Um, other, this or anything else? No, it's a late night and I appreciate folks being here.